today, we have um, Mr. Vartan, Dr. Vartan Gregorian, one of the co-founders who I think most of you know. Uh, and also, we are joined by this year's laureate, Mr. Cho Hala Ang. So, <laughs> now as an American, uh, I'm going to save everybody the, uh, the embarrassment of trying to uh, pronounce everything phonetically. So we're going to refer to Mr. Cho Hala Ang as Mr. Ang with deep respect. So uh, as you put forth your questions, uh, just feel free to say Mr. Ang. So we'd like to start it off and have Vartan say a few remarks uh, about the prize, about today's events, and of course about this year's laureate. So with that, Vartan. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'm delighted to meet you. Uh, three years ago, when we founded this organization, it was our hope that it will last from 90, 2050 to 2022, because that was the period of the genocide. We wanted to remind people that while Armenians, while Armenians were a small nation, after 100 years of mourning and remembering, that's not enough, but we have to look forward to the future. And therefore, we are well equipped to testify what genocide is, but also try to help people who helped us during World War I on. For example, Americans uh, registered in 1914, 1915 to 1922, one of the largest philanthropic mobilizations in United States history. Instead of 10 million, they were able to collect $100 million World War I. And that money went to feed at least 300,000 Armenian orphans. Some of this help even lasted till Sovietization of Armenia until 1923. Now most of these Armenians now are United States and Armenia and others. So people who helped us we try and see what can we do to help others who are suffering similar treatment or will be suffering similar treatment. So that's why we have chosen three candidates last three years to exemplify individuals who had their own physical, reputational, financial, intellectual harassment and demise have taken the role of helping a country and a cause or people. So far, we've been very lucky. The latest is Mr. Rang, as mentioned, uh, from, uh, all the way from Burma, now Miramar, uh, because he also is trying to witness what is, may happen is happening, may happen. Today, I learned from him that all the libraries for his ethnic group have been uprooted, kind of assassination of memory. So if memory dies, not we don't remember anything, we won't have to lose anything or complain about anything. As a lawyer, he has, you have his biography, he has dedicated himself a cause. He could have been easily gone to become a corporate lawyer or accident lawyer or so forth and live happily in Myanmar in a good middle class life by having clients and so forth without endangering his life with other things. So these are exemplary people that we've chosen last three years. And last night somebody said, will they, we stop this? The answer is no. We're trying to find out ways in which we can go on. We've been very surprised how national, international support has been received by uh, Aurora. Aurora also has not stopped in just choosing and giving uh, a medal or money we do, we're the only ones who have come up with a novel way of doing it. Out of 1,100,000, 100,000 goes to the recipient. 1 million will go to organizations that are active in the field of fighting injustice, human rights, and so forth. So this is, award itself is accentuating the impact, not one time, but through others. Each of the organizations that uh, recipients have designated as possible uh, receiver, we have examined their finances, their reputation, their history, 
So we don't have to do anything that goes wrong, betraying the expectations of the donor, receiver and the donor. And one other thing, Armenians usually ask me, why can't you spend that money in Armenia? Well, lots of $1 million have been spent in Armenia. What this has accomplished to internationalize Armenia, to put genocide in the historical context, more people are coming to Armenia to know as a result of this. We also have held dialogues in Berlin, in Moscow, in New York, and others, which normally we could not have been able to do it. So we're also forming, not isolationist, we're forming a kind of unity of purpose with all international organizations. So I have been personally gratified how much reputation has Aurora built internationally, how many people are collaborating with us, how many people are going to invest in, Amer in Armenia, how many people are coming to Armenia, how many people no longer tell, remember starving Armenians, finish your meal, because we're not starving now, but at the same time we're building. And the idea that this little Armenia, later we talked, this little Armenia can witness for Miramar all the way, Southeast Asia. And Ong will represent his ethnic group here, finding, when he's been abandoned by many, finding this aurora, singling out his Muslim ethnic group, his persecuted group, to remember them, to defend them, to go to their cause, in itself is gratifying, because during World War I, we know exactly what to remember. Being Christian was not enough. Germany was Christian. Austria-Hungary was Christian. Italy was Christian. But they separated their national interests versus their religious interests. And that's another reason why I'm very proud that uh, all the nominees that have come, they've come hundreds of nominees from all over the world because they see us as defending something which is universal, not parochial. We're not interested in just the recognition of genocide. We know it happened, everybody knows it happened. Now we're interested in lessons learned, how others will prevent it. We're interested in forming alliances among the oppressed, among threatened, because dignity of human dignity, freedom, movement, citizenship, the concept of citizenship from Roman Empire on has been an important issue. To deny citizenship to his ethnic group in Rangan, in Miramar, 21st century, where everybody hails constitution, liberty, and so forth, is very sad. So that's why I'm very happy with what we started of giving back now has become movement going forward, building alliances, commemorating, but celebrating, but also building the kind of network which we have never had it before. And that's why I'm very proud to be associated with this. This would not have happened without the vision of uh, Ruben Vartanian and as well Duba Rafayan. My governor from New Jersey, Governor Tom Kane, very popular governor, head of 9-11 commission is here. And last night he was telling me, Vartan, he was former university president, they're always great, great ideas. But great ideas without visionaries, without entrepreneurs, intel and I'm, I don't mention financial entrepreneurs, intellectual entrepreneurs, would not be realized. And here is the combination, one entrepreneur from Russia, one entrepreneur from MIT, and one historian reminding people this has been tried in the past and so forth, have formed a kind of alliance reaching out, but more important, others are reaching us. It's not the issue of money, it's much cause, organization, and impact. So with that, I'd like to open uh, this uh, to your questions. Be as blunt as you want, as direct as you want, uh, and uh, I don't mind that. Uh, I have met many student reporters from my San Francisco free speech days all the way now, and if you don't ask the right questions, I will ask on your behalf. I'll ask to myself to answer a question that you did not ask. So with that, Mr. Rang, welcome. Yes, this is the first time you meet American press. Yes, thank you. 
All right, this is the best. <laughs> yes. Armenian press, American press, Russian press, German <laughs> press, I think Italian press. <laughs> the best is here. Yeah. And some of these people years later, you'll see their names yeah. in large headlines because by then they would have been celebrities. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Thank you. So, so can I talk something? Please. More? You ask. No, why don't you say a few words? Sure. <laughs> yes, that's why I'm asking. Uh, I'm Jola Aung. My name is Jola Aung, but you can call Aung. It is difficult to, to call three words uh, for me. So, uh, I am from Myanmar, Yakai State. And Yakai State, Sitwe is the capital of this state. So, I was uh, a, an stenographer, a stenographer uh, in state court for 24 years. Then uh, during this, this period, after uh, 20 years, uh, when I was working, there are some uh, discrimination is uh, rising up among Yakai and Muslim. I am Muslim. So I tried to retire from my job. I approached to a physician to get invalid pension. So the phys physician, he was a Muslim from Bama side. He is very close to my cousin. My cousin is a, also a medical doctor. And my father-in-law is a ma medical doctor, was a medical doctor in Miao U. Miao U is, at the time, capital of Yakai State, before this uh, Yakai era. So then I retired from that job, getting invalid pension. Then I conduct as a lawyer uh, in Yakai State. A group of farmers in 1986 came to me. They tried to get other good lawyer, but no lawyer handled this case because this uh, government is to be confiscated all the farming land, lands of them. So at last they came to me and to write a petition to General Ne Wing. At that time, General Ne Wing was the uh, chairman of the Myanmar Socialist Party. So I wrote a petition to General Ne Wing and sent all the copies to uh, this state authority. So I went to Yangon, but they disturb me at airport. I have to wait two days and, and also to request them to allow me to go to Yangon. But at last, they allow me to go to Yangon. After arrive in, arrival in Yangon, I put all the application to concern office, then I return to Sitwe. So the authority arrest me and after a few days, 10 other farmers, elders. So they arrest me as a political case. They sue me a political case and sent up to the court. So we are under trial for two years. Within two years, the judge didn't decide the case. They are taking the lay tactics of this case. So in 1988, the whole country was under strike against the New England government. So on the 25th of August, 1988, Sitwe prison was broken by the prisoners. But we are the political prisoner. We are kept separate in cell room. So I was in cell room under lock and key, I cannot go out. The other prisoners ran away. And at last, at night, the lawyers, bar chamber, form a committee to control the town, the city. So because all the lawyers are your kind, so they form a committee and they came to the prison to release uh, everybody, and also I was released at 9 or 10 
a PM. Then I was sick at that time. So I went to, uh, with my, some colleagues to my house and my family was very, now at that time, very poorly surviving there. So after a few days, General Somong coped the power for the country. Somong, General Somong, you, uh, you will get on the history of this. Then he announced that he want to make the country democratic country. So he ordered to register the peop politics party in Yangon. So my, some colleagues, also they are lawyer in Yangon, they tried to register a party and invite me to Yangon. So I went to Yangon. At that time, we can go easily to Yangon. So uh, with, uh, with my, our national registration card. I have my own national registration card is, is still handling. And also with that national registration card, I apply for my passport in 2014. I got it. So I can travel to other country. Then at that time, we can go anywhere with this registration card. So we form a political party named National Democratic Party for Human Rights. I was the vice president of this party. President is there, chairman is there, one advocate, Uchilmi, he is still alive in Yangon. He is a famous lawyer in Yangon. He is the president. So then we also try to organize our people for vote. It will be held in 1990, May 27. So we registered everything there. Also, our party selected me to stand from number one position in Sitwe, our township. So it was registered and also the commission also accept with my documents to stand for. Mr. Mr. Ong, uh, if I could just uh, interrupt for a second. Um, if we could, uh, and, and I think there'll be time for folks to get the more detailed uh, I will be summarized. Okay, because yeah. we'd like to get there some questions. Yeah. So. Then, also then, for that reason, uh, again, the Western commander arrested me and sent me in prison and sent up my case uh, for court martial. So court martial ordered me 14 years. I was uh, released from, uh, from prison in 1997. I joined Medicine Science Frontier Holland in 1998 as administrator till 2012. So in 2012, the government arrested me again without any reason. They sent me to the prison. Our village was destroyed, and we were uh, all my families were drove to IDP camps. So, in after two months and five days, uh, things saying uh, when this our country manager applied for, to release me, they released me uh, after two months and five days on the 20, uh, 16 August. Uh, 2012, 2012. So then, again, they arrest me in 2013 for the verification cases problem. Then, so after my release, I am doing all the for education of our people, our children, uh, and elderly education, and also for sick person. Uh, disease people, so we are trying to send them to general hospital, and but in general hospital, the doctor and nurse didn't take care of our Rohingya people there. So now we are facing this thing. So I don't know how this Aurora get all my history uh, and also select me for this prize. So I am surprised. Let, that. let me ask you that. I think uh, everybody has read your bio. Yeah. So they know about general picture. Yeah. I think important thing is what you're trying to convey 
your frustration that you follow the legal road. Yeah. And legal road law has betrayed you by yeah. not allowing you yeah, access yeah. to it. So, so that's the we are going under law and order, but the government didn't treat us under law and order. So let them ask questions. So let's, let's open it up for questions. Yeah. So, okay. questions? Yeah, and you, could you just, and you just state your name, so, and who you want to speak to. Hello, I'm Joshua Carroll. I'm a freelancer. I'm filing something for the Daily Beast. Um, my question is for Vartan. Um, the Rohingya crisis is, is um, like lots of crises in the world, but especially the Rohingya crisis, is not really something you can solve by just throwing money at it. Of course, there's a huge need for aid, but um, at the same time, the, Rakhine, um, the government is stopping access for aid agencies to get into Rakhine State. So even if aid agencies are well funded, it doesn't necessarily mean the aid is going to get to people um, inside Rakhine State. Um, the, the, the reason I say this is, um, do, you, do you feel that the Aurora Initiative also has some kind of responsibility to not just fund um, really worthwhile projects like this, but also sort of advocate politically and to pressure countries like the US and countries that are Security Council members to sort of take other forms of action? Or, or do you not see that as the role of the Aurora Prize? Let me answer. The issue we're dealing is not independence, separate state, and so forth, but rather the idea that an ethnic group, my understanding is, is refused to be recognized as an ethnic group, this ethnic group. And second, they refuse to be given citizenship or travel for. And this is not a separatist movement. Mm -hmm. this, does, this does not want to be a part. Yeah, it was to be part of the state. Mm -hmm. If I answered your question, what's the part that did not answer? Just. Yeah, so I, I didn't, wasn't implying it was a separatist movement. I, I meant, was, what, what I meant was, do you see it as Aurora's role, for example, to um, petition countries who might have the yeah. power to um, to take Security Council action and that kind of thing. For example, R Russia and China are, are yeah. seen as blocking potential um, uh, Security Council action to yeah. refer Myanmar to the ICC. Um, well, they have said, Security Council has sent Kofi Annan report, has not realized anything. Uh, later, there's another Security Council envoy. United Nations has sent envoys, but none of their recommendations have been followed through. It's not because of uh, uh, Russia and China blocking it, but in general, even though government has agreed to execute certain things, nothing has happened. In the meantime, uh, there's the theory that you're not really part of uh, Miramar or Burma, but you're right of Bangladesh. Why don't you go home? So these people, some of them from 11th, 12th, 13th century have been there. They're not newcomers. And that's the issue. It's a very complicated issue. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, we're trying to highlight the issue, not specific political solution, but rather not to eliminate this ethnic group, not to suppress them, but try to give them right dignity and protection, whoever it may be. If it comes to United Nations, they say we'll send a force to separate them and so forth. I don't think it will reach that way because uh, nobody's asking for separate statehood, autonomous zone and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Just to be clear, that wasn't that wasn't what I was okay, getting at well, at all. Okay. Anyway, I can. I think you have to talk on the phone. You know, the, uh, I did not hear all the nuances of your question. You're talking too close to the mic, and I'm talking too far from the mic. <laughs> so we're going. <laughs> wait, wait. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Right here. Armenian European magazine Orej Anna Karapetyan, Mr. On, uh, this prize is not only an appreciation but uh, rather a cool uh, uh, toolkit. How are you going to use it? Uh, Dr. Gregorian uh, clarified how the finances are going to di dist be distributed, but how that will change your activities personally? Thank you. Getting finances for the, my work? You mean? Your activities, how it will change it? How, how is the 1,100,000 oh, yes. uh, going to change your work yeah. as well as your associated organizations that are beneficiaries oh, yes. of this? Yeah. I had already shared 1 million 
to three NGOs. So I sent letters to Aurora, so uh, they agree, and these three NGOs also agree for that. So one is Medicine Sense Frontier, UK. Another one is Masi, Malaysia. Another one is ICMC, International Catholic Migration Commission, also Malaysia, and also they base in uh, Switzerland. So also they arrive here. And this is the uh, one million for one million. So is there any? Your activities, please. How is it going to influence your activities? Uh, I, I work for MSF in Sitwe, Yekhain State, for 14 years as administrator. I handle all the, uh, this cash and uh, all the bookkeeping so that I know that they are properly doing their uh, financial work. Even though I cannot travel to UK, I believe them, I trust them that they will use uh, for this uh, project. Okay, right here. Um, I, I'm Dan Damon from BBC World Service. Oh. He didn't seem to understand the question. What you are asking, we are actually like this. Dhabi Malaysia is activity here to do co-abamani here to do here. My activity won't be affected to that, that because they cannot operate their job work in our. Uh, the MSF Holland was drove out. So they are working in Bangladesh for refugees. MSF UK is working in Bangladesh. There are yesterday also all the expatriate uh, described that 51% is children. So they are working there in Bangladesh. So uh, the, I give uh, this 40% of this 1 million to MSF UK. Okay, so right here, BBC. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dan Damon. Um, what's your message to Aung San Suu Kyi, who had a reputation as a human rights hero? <laughs> Is she come to know that I think she will Invite me and I will explain her uh, what we should do <laughs> dealing with her. <laughs> no, I think that she will invite me. Otherwise, uh, if she didn't invite, so I cannot do anything with her. Have you met her? Pardon? Have you ever met her? <laughs> also, some. Uh, some no, 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 no. Some ambassadors also informed her there was, is a person in Yakai State. You should meet her. But she never <laughs> arrived in Yakai State. Once also she visited in Mongdo uh, to, to see this uh, uh, happening when uh, it was also set fire village by village. So, but uh, she didn't uh, visit uh, every site. She Sorry. didn't invite me, <laughs> even though I have very difficult to travel from Sitwe to Yangon. She ordered to have our subordinate officers to issue scrutiny card, those who are handling national registration card. But the subordinate officer did not, didn't obey her order. Right here. Hi, how are you? Um, Juliet Pennington from Boston. It's a cold, sorry. Um, piggybacking off of her question, um, how will being awarded this prize help to ensure that the Rohingya people will be able to return safely to Myanmar? And how soon do you think this process will commence? We cannot say it uh, properly. I cannot say because uh, UN and UNDP, 
they are m made an agreement a few days ago for repatriation. So, but we cannot believe that it, it can be happen or not. But will this help being awarded this yes. prize? Yes. <laughs> okay. I think I, you did not answer it. How would this help resolve the issue anyway? For this impact, or yes, your uh, receipt, your activities. How would this enhance your activities? So it, it is not concerned with us because we are live in Sitwe. It's happened in Mongdo. We cannot travel there. We cannot travel there. We cannot give any help to them. Yesterday, you, I think uh, you, you can see in a uh, video there, w I mentioned there. I cannot travel to Mongdo Buti down to any other township, not to downtown in Sitwe, where my land is situated, my premises is situated. I cannot. Okay. Okay. Back here. Hi, uh, Jessica Abrahams from DevEx. Um, I have a question for Barton. This event has been amazing, um, but it obviously takes a huge amount of resources to put an event like this together. Excuse so me, can you speak slowly? Uh, sure, but it's for <laughs> Dr. Gregory. <laughs> That's all right. Oh, I, it will help me also if you speak slowly. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think we'd all agree that this weekend has been amazing, but it obviously takes a huge amount of resources, financial resources, to put together an event like this. So given that, what's the value of these kind of prizes for the humanitarian sector and why is it worth putting those resources into it? The last one, you... Why is it worth... Uh, I'm sorry, both of us cannot understand. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can come to the front. <laughs> That's all right. So they're, yeah. they're, they're entitled yeah, yeah, yeah. to a hero. The basic question is, why is it worth spending resources on an event right. like this? Yeah. Now, if I, I'm sorry I got your colleague's question wrong. I don't want to be wrong again. So <laughs> let me ask you properly. Are you saying, what is, the, why are we doing what we do? Yeah. You're right? Yeah. Why are you spending the amount of money? No, I mentioned the amount of money. First of all, the amount of money is private money. All right? It comes not only from three people, it comes now from 100, 200 different individuals. Because as I mentioned in my remarks, we have great ideas, but they never come to fruition. And I get very frustrated. It is a great idea which has come to fruition, much better, more important than we expected. All right? Because when we're invited to Berlin to form an alliance with German organizations, when we're invited to uh, the Museum of Natural History, which is 9-11 victims, one of the major institutions in New York, to appear with them to a joint thing about empathy and philanthropy, why people give. When we are, uh, have an index, humanitarian index, knowing how many rich people are helping the poor, how many poor people are helping the poor. It's remarkable that out of $390 billion amount of money that Americans give annually, to charitable causes, most of it comes from people who make less than fifty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. The same thing as our research has indicated, poor are more generous, relatively poor, than the rich. All of these are to clarify the way, are we each other's guardians and so forth, so we go from rhetoric to actually action in evidence. Everything we do has to have an impact. We're reaching 60 million or whatever, you know, the. Uh, Aurora, that does not impress me as much as whether how many organizations now are taking us in the leadership role and helping us to resolve problems or highlight problems. Armenia has not uh, lost anything. We could easily put one million here. In the past, we could have corruption and so forth disappear. This is first thing that I mentioned in my remarks previously has international impact, has international presence is bringing uh, investments here, is bringing reputation, is dealing with gen uh, gen genocide much more effectively with all the money we have spent in the past 50 years. Because we have always tried to take each other. We have never gone to the external world. And for us, it's become a fetish that if government does not recognize our genocide, well, 
we will get mesmerized. I don't care whether they recognize or not. It's a reality. We have to act on it. Uh, and if people want to recognize our genocide, they should recognize for their own sake, their own liberation, rather than for, to do favor to us after a century. This is one thing is of working. Because everybody wants to invest. They want whether it will go to the right cause or not. So everything you saw this morning, Aurora, Rice, and so forth, is bringing other donors for educational. Let me mention another other thing. In addition to Aurora, there's IDEA also. One of the major investments in Armenia have been made by Ruben Vartanian, including Trali, uh, the uh, funicular, all the way to Datev, including a college and so forth. So people who don't do anything, I don't want to say sidelines and criticizing what's happening, why this, why not, and so forth. Either get involved, put up, or support. Rhetoric does not count anymore. We have had many speeches, many wonderful things. But for the first time, I am involved because I see results. I see when we get money for the Batena, the run books are purchased, books are renovated. When we, things are happening. The most important thing, it is, as well as uh, this will do, to invest in uh, education of Armenian youth and to stop emigration out of Armenia to the diaspora. And that's what my purpose is. And this is going to help us a lot. So for the first time, people in diaspora, never been involved with Armenia, are involving themselves with Armenia and Armenian causes. Thanks to, you know, you can see last night, 100 major donors from Brazil, from Latin America, from Russia, all of them were here. We've never had that before. So I'm happy uh, if you know, anybody has constructive way how we can improve it. But if they sit down without having been involved themselves, without having contributed anything, what if we could have done this, we could have done? In the past, uh, I'm too old now, in the past after 60 years, I have heard so many preachings, so many speeches. So I can finish anybody's speech, you start here, I can finish it. I was one of those also, critic and so forth. Do something, get involved, but don't stay out. That's why all these four laureates are wonderful because they have been involved. They're delivering, better or worse. They have no other alternatives. There are not many of them risking their lives, their careers, their reputation in order to be able. So I'm very proud that we're allies of these individuals and organizations. So somebody can say we had lavish breakfast this morning. So be it, yes, I'm glad we have. It, brought, it hired many workers from Ashtarak. It brought many Armenian contractors and so forth. It created many jobs, uh, electricians and others. But we got 3,000 volunteers, 3,000 Armenian youth, free of charge, free of this, wanted to up Aurora, 3,000. Name me any organization that got 3,000 volunteers. And that's the success. So instead of going to uh, details, take the overall picture. Recognition, impact, cooperation, pride, and being international for a change rather than parochial. Thank you. Great. Uh, right here. Um, yep, yep. Hi, I'm Annalisa Merali, I write for Quartz. I have two questions. Uh, please uh, speak louder, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Annalisa Merali and I write for Quartz. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first is, is there any plan uh, from the Aurora Prize to track um, the way that the money is spent, uh, that it's delivered? Like, do you sort of require any accountability down the line? Um, and then the second is uh, for both of you, actually. And is uh, so yesterday we heard a bit about how during the Armenian genocide, the international community and especially the US uh, were very, uh, very supportive and, and very helpful of the Armenian community. Uh, and we live now in a context where the opposite is happening, not just when it comes to the U.S., but the international community isn't really uh, helping and supporting uh, victims of genocide and, you know, refugees all over. Um, what can communities who are involved and interested in humanitarian work do to hold their governments accountable and to push more generosity and more uh, work for refugees and victims of uh, Genocide. Is that addressed to me or to all of us? Both of them. Okay. okay. The answer short is yes, there are plans. All right? That's the first part. Second part is 
that the Aurora Index itself demonstrated that what's happening, rich countries are not accepting as many refugees, as many victims, and so forth, as the poor countries. Pakistan has more, Jordan has more re refugees, Germany has 660,000, the largest in Europe. As you heard from uh, uh, head of Kushner, uh, the uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, France has taken a handful. Holland debating, Denmark debating, uh, Hungary as if God created only a Hungarian nation. They don't want anybody else to come. Uh, nationalist populism is anti-immigrant throughout Europe. And nobody is dealing with issues, including, by the way, Holocaust. Uh, Poland is debating whether Polish description of Poles is correct and so on. We're facing exactly, unfortunately, something like 1930s, uh, a rise of nationalism, where we thought nationalism died during World War I, World War II. Nationalism is raising. And one of the things I also will mention, 1912, Prime Minister of Russia said, the only way you can defeat revolutions is use nationalism. Nationalism is the best antidote of any change. And that we see now all over Europe, unfortunately, and all over, everywhere practically. Immigrants, foreigners are seen as potential enemies or potential detractors or loafers, which is most unfortunate, because European Union principle was shared governance and equality, and we're facing difficulties. Genocide recognition is easy now. If you have, no, you have to pay no reparations, no <laughs> remedies, I can pass a law and say yes. And I'm very surprised I'm by myself in that category, so I don't mind it. We have been immobilized that how come X country does not recognize Armenian genocide? Well, so what? Even the United States has recognized they're using Metzger, Armenian word, in order not to use genocide. If I were in charge, I would put on the bottom of President Obama's, uh, President uh, Trump's, any president's proclamation of April 24, a small big line, translation, Metzgeren, Holocaust, genocide. So let the White House say, no, it doesn't mean that. It's their problem, we made it our problem because they did not use the right word. As far as I'm concerned, Yeren, if you recognize Yeren, Armenian word for genocide, put a note on the bottom PS, and they just say it was recognized. Let anybody deny who have recognized. They recognize, but they camouflage in such a way so they would not be fitting legalistic theory. As far as I'm concerned, I don't care about that after a century. There are other issues, how to prevent other ones. And frankly, in your second part of the question, a lot of potential genocides may happen. But the, the kind of... Uh, Indignity, indignation, revolt, disgust is not following them with action. Look at this, what happened in, Ch in Syria. Love what's happening Kurds now. What's happening Palestine? All kinds of things are happening. I think they said normal, and we cannot accept them as normal. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Okay. So, so my name's uh, Gary Lee, freelance American journalist from Washington. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but the first one is to Mr. Ong. You mentioned that you are concentrating a lot of your efforts on the education of the elderly and of youth. Can you say specifically what, what you're doing in that regard and why you decided to concentrate in that area? and how Aurora is going to help you with that concentration. Yes. Since 2012, after my release from the prison... Speak to the mic. Uh, after, yes. After my, my release from the prison, uh, one medical doctor from Shani State, they visit there to see the IDPs. Mm. Uh, so she told me that 
uh, you are an educated person, you should organize these children to be educated. So at that time they helped me and also we organized these children and also oh, we can open all the schools. Uh, nearly we appointed 110 teachers at that time. Then after that, it, one year, after one year, I was again arrested. So at that time, this uh, committee, we formed a committee there. Also, these committee members were afraid of the government. Also, they didn't handle for education. Then the, all the teachers also apply uh, to other jobs and for NGO because th uh, their salary is very high. So then it was uh, stopped. After my release again, uh, the, all the school at that time, we opened there. And after my release again in 2014, I organized for elderly people uh, to send their children to school and to teach them renting some teachers, village by village. For, because their illiteracy is, illiteracy is very high, so they cannot put their signature on the paper. So we do such thing for elderly people. We print, out, print some books in Yangon. Also my colleagues, also they sent to me and we distribute all the villages there, and also we are doing such thing. Uh, young children to send to school, elderly people to, uh, to be l learn and teach in after afternoon time. So can you say specifically how the Aurora Prize will help you in this mission? This now, after that, this, uh, we, after when we are doing this thing, in 25th August uh, 2017, the problem again arose in Mongdo. So we have to stop all these things. Except the children, we have to, to stop elderly people education because the government can allege us that we are organizing elderly people for something. I think what Gary was trying to find out is, with the money, then I saw that after this conflict in Mongdo, all, most of the peoples in Mongdo flee to Bangladesh. So we have to take care of this uh, refugees, so that I share this one million uh, USD to MSF UK and Marcy and ICMC. The, uh, peoples are also fleeing to Malaysia and to Indonesia, Thailand, like this. But the issue is, uh, they're asking, the issue is how does it help that production? This, uh, this money will go to these IDPs, uh, 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 refugees, so it is a kind of help to them. Okay, right up front. We have to stop everything there, except the young children. Okay, right here. Elena After Gabriel. this conflict in Mongdo, we have to stop. I think uh, what's happening, uh, so they know all of this. They're asking specific question, how much you'll be doing for elderly or children, what plans you have, rather than government stopped it. And so it's clear to them uh, about government intervention, government jailing, and so forth. It was asking specific question, how would you use this money to enhance elderly and I, children? I share okay. this money That's, to you. Uh, those organizations were dealing with There are three organizations. Okay. Yes. Okay. So they are doing all these things for humanitarian okay. activities. Yes. Activities. Okay. So right here. 
Thank you. Elena Gabrielian from International French Radio, RFI from Paris. I have a question for Mr. Gregorian. Uh, Aurora Prize is taking place in Armenia since uh, three years. Louder, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Aurora Prize takes place in Armenia since three years. What are your plans for the next year? Do you want to keep organizing it in Armenia or you want to export or make travel? Aurora uh, abroad, and uh, if it is the case, maybe you have an ideas yeah. about the countries. Thank you. We are, we are studying to see what we can do. Last night I joked, I said, uh, we'll freeze it because I'm in charge of Gregorian calendar. I say 2020 considers to be 2020 for three, four years. By fiat, we can say it continues. But we don't want to be irresponsible, do expand without knowing the impact. <laughs> So currently we'll be studying how to institutionalize this and how to go forward. And we'll let uh, naturally with issues, uh, results. Everything we have done has been, uh, as you know, uh, shared with the public. All our documents, all our findings, all our finances, everything has been public. So what we will do, study to see if it has great impact. Whether by expanding you'll weaken the mission or whether expansion requires by the mission, and that's what our, we're studying now. Okay, so we have, we're getting close. I know the gentlemen have to leave soon, so we're gonna take three more questions. Yellow? Make it four. Right? Four, okay. Here, here, and you. So we're gonna go, you first. If one question, and then I will, we'll, we'll move quickly. I think uh, she's the most important person here. She's telling people what to ask, so why don't you ask her a question? <laughs> Nina Martin from the Scientific Association, UK News is also here. Um, just, the question is, with the growing platform and reputation of Aurora, what responsibility does it have to affect diplomatic change to humanitarian issues? Systematic change? Diplomatic. Diplomatic, I was a diplomatic change. I don't know how to answer that. You guys, uh, what are we going to in the realm of diplomacy? Okay. Well, we, we're not involved in diplomacy, influencing governments and so forth. We're interested in forming alliances on humanitarian and others. If we enter the diplomacy and so forth, we become a non, not non-profit, a lobbying group and so forth, which we cannot. Because in America, for example, a lobbying group, you're not entitled to deduct your taxes. Here, uh, here uh, you've got your lobbying group. You are under the guise of the profit. You're starting trying to change policy and others. But here, we're trying to keep politics as much possible as out because our change is not political change. Our change is building alliances for the profit on issues of discrimination, on issues uh, that are related to the genocide that is trying to eliminate a culture, eliminate a group, causing genocide. There are so many other people are involved in diplomatic issues, economic issues. We're trying to focus translating Armenian experience of genocide, how to prevent and how to appreciate and how to uh, take care of it. That's our sole thing. And that I did not find you could see so much hunger abroad for alliances of that sort for organizations that are doing solo, how to build their alliances and work together. So I wanted to say that the past few days and last year as well, um, the Aurora Dialogues, we saw a lot of great people, human rights advocates, but I wanted to ask, especially now that we live a lot of our lives in like a, a bit of an echo chamber um, and we don't confront ourselves often with different opinions, do you think it would bring value to the Aurora Prize to maybe invite people who have a completely different stance on, say, immigration, so that um, the Aurora Dialogues could be more of a confrontation and a debate? Yes, we are, we are doing that. We, by politics, everything is political. If we say immigrants are good, it's a political stand. If we say refugees need hope, it is a political stand. But we come from empathy point of view, sympathy point of view, solidarity point of view, rather than merely, you better do this or else there'll be revolution and so forth. That's part, part of our uh, main strength. The answer is yes, we are involved on issues. We have taken stand. <coughs> Carnegie Corporation, which I had, is spending 
substantial amount on democracy and immigration and others, and I'm glad to continue this. But uh, the other thing is, European Bosch Foundation, Volkswagen Foundation, all kinds of organizations in England, in the Bodwan Foundation, all of them are working solo. We're trying to form alliance so we can have some impact. And that's one of the things, uh, uh, causes that we defend have relevance on issues that you're discussing. It's not just educational we're doing. In a sense, it's political in one sense that issues are controversial. We've taken some controversial issues, uh, empathy against genocide, against uh, destitution, against all of this. So the answer is yes, I hope so, at yes, least. Thank you. So we're going to take two more right here, and then, and then you're next, you're, I promise. Yeah, you've been trying for a lot some time, so let's see. <laughs> thank you. Um, this one is actually for Mr. Ang. First, congratulations. My question is simple. Are you still worried that you could be arrested? And since the Aurora Prize, is it more likely that you're going to have problems with the law or your safety? Or is it easier now? Thank you. So I cannot expect it. Why? I am fear, fearness of this uh, for the arrest because here are some, uh, this is the ceremony of genocide. So th the government can allege me why you attend this genocide <laughs> memorial day. <laughs> so, I, but I didn't afraid of it. I will explain to them why I <laughs> went there to <laughs> Aurora. So I will explain them. Uh, but uh, you heard that Ukoni was assassinated at airport, Yangon airport. So uh, this morning I told to a, 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 my colleague in when after my, this prize was awarded. So I am afraid of that, uh, only that. So yes. It's your first time in Armenia. And what impressions do you have? Uh, have you managed to get acquainted with other nominees of our Aurora during these days? And whose story impressed you more? It is very hard to come to Armenia for me, but I tried and I succeeded to visit Armenia. It takes nearly 20 days and I have to spend more money there. For these two remaining uh, nominees, their job is also very good. I like it. But our Aurora Prize, this uh, uh, the fund has very less, so uh, they cannot provide them. So next year they will consider, I think they, they should consider and these two nominees should uh, try to their project more and more to be considered by the Aurora Prize. And Mr. Ong, what did you think of Armenia and the Armenian people? Eh? Oh, oh, Armenia is very nice, very polite country, and uh, all the peoples are very polite and nice and very Hospitality is great, so I like uh, very much Armenia. Just I told our gentleman uh, at library what we are suffering for the record keeping and what the Armenia is doing. I compare, I also explain to them, this librarian and also our chairman also. So just real quick housekeeping. The event tonight starts at 7 o'clock at the Opera House. Please bring your credentials and an ID so you can get in. But Vartan, if I could just ask you to wrap it up with a, some brief, quick comments. Uh, I think uh, it's clear that from your questions and some of your frustration that uh, Mr. Rang is so much, suffered so much prison and others that what they were asking, general concept issue, he personalizes 
and it frustrates you because you did not, you think he's avoiding issue, he does not. He is trying through personal experience to answer your general question, which sometimes works, sometimes does not work. But second, uh, was he was here, he was surprised in the middle of Yerevan, we have an 18th century blue mosque that uh, has been restored for Muslims who come to tourists from Iran and other Muslim countries have a place to worship and without any problem and so forth. He was also surprised today we in, in, uh, included him in the annals of our Mateda Daran, which is repository of Armenia's memory and heritage culture. Formally, we took this Aurora induction to be incorporated with the history because he and I believed that the libraries are the ones that give you mortality. Nobody else can guarantee earthly mortality except libraries and museums. So you don't make any librarian enemy of yours because if they decide you don't exist, in 10, 50 years you would not exist. And, but unfortunately his library was destroyed, so he has now a host library, Madena Dara. Last thing, what he was surprised, uh, I think uh, touched, that there was competing three we selected him because the others are segmental issues, central issues, but he's discussing the fate of his community, ethnic community. Nobody has responsibility as much he has, he told us, that the entire fate of Rohingya, he thinks, is responsibility. If he fails, they fail. I said also responsibility. That's what he's eager to document personal experiences in order for you to understand his dilemma. Uh, so he's not evasive of the answers. He's just, uh, this first time he's been also expressed freely uh, to free press who can pre publish what he says rather than censor what he says. And last point I will mention, uh, uh, we had, I'm a member of the jury, and we had, we spent two hours deciding very difficult choice, but we came on his side unanimously, in a sense. Always have consensus. We never have divisions. And also, for all of you, we have only two Armenians in the uh, for, for team member jury. Lord Darcy from England, who's participating for the first time, and me. So, entire Aurora funders are given independence to an international jury select. And many Armenians don't understand why couldn't we choose this and so forth. Because these are international standards. Mary Robinson, president of Ireland, was head of international uh, human rights. Gida, uh, uh, Gida, uh, her last name? Uh, no. Gida. Yeah, he, he participated on the phone. Uh, we have the, uh, Dr. Kushner, head of Medicine Sans Frontier, is there. So, They've reached this conclusion from all angles, legal angle, UN angle, a medical angle, uh, all of them experienced uh, because we care for the ethnic community. Now it happens also something wonderful that you, none of you asked, because I, that I, should, I would have asked. Can you imagine a Muslim, which he is, Rohingya, signing Catholic mission to distribute some of the money for Rohingya. That's the most wonderful thing I've noticed. It's a faith that this is not religious thing, it's an ethnic issue, and we transcend, he transcends, he transcends the film in order to be able to uh, bring universal support for him. Okay, I think Mr. Ong is very late for a meeting, so I see my colleague over there. Uh, so with that, if you have any, if you want to spend some time with either one of the gentlemen, look up me, Ben, or Mike, and we'll make sure it happens. Thank you all for coming out, and thank uh, you. Congratulations again, Mr. Owen. <laughs>